I'm glad I unlocked okay. that door. All right, everyone remember to mute yourself. Um, we, we're, we're hearing someone, so that might you might not want that to be you. So just remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking. All right, so um, we're, we've moved on from our business, first business items. Um, so Joey will now take on the uh, public comment period. Joey, I'll pass it to you. All right, so as a reminder at each of our meetings, we have uh, set aside time for public comment for members who are uh, attending by phone to this meeting. We ask that members or that folks here to make a public comment, keep their comments to a minute um, and comment on items that are on our agenda if possible or items that you would like our committee to take up. Um, and at this time I would uh, ask that members could please mute yourself uh, for this time period. But if you're here to make a public comment, Please unmute yourself from your phone by pushing star six and then state your name if you're here to make a comment. So once again, if you are. Hi there, can uh, you hear me? Yes, yes. Welcome to our committee. Can you state your name, please? Yeah, my name is Andrew Falstrom. Um, I, I just had the horror Please, of, of yeah I just had the horror of hearing one of your own members Cecil Smith along with other landlords testified to ending the eviction moratorium and creating off ramps from it uh, the eviction moratorium that has protected so many people during a global pandemic and I just I I trust this committee to know that that's the absolute wrong direction we spent a summer with encampments all over the city uh, homelessness is an increasing problem. And we need you all to stand up for renter protections in the city. And I really look forward to this committee supporting the path for rent stabilization in Minneapolis that'll be moving forward for Just Cause uh, Defense Against Evictions and everything else that we need to protect our people here in Minneapolis. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew, um, for your public comment. Is there anyone else who is here uh, by phone who would like to make a public comment and if so you can unmute yourself at this time by pressing star six. I, I do just want to make a comment that I appreciate the sentiment. I think I would just invite people to refrain from maybe referring specifically to individual members um, and focus on the content instead. Am I, is anyone he, else here to make a public comment today? I'll just give it one more second. In case you need to unmute yourself, please press star six. All right, hearing none, I will uh, close our public comment period for today's meeting. Um, so just a quick reminder overview for today's meeting. We amended, uh, had to amend since the clerk, Casey Carl, was not able to be with us to do an overview of the legislative process. We'll work on getting that on a future agenda. Um, and I think the next item on our agenda is election of 2021 committee leadership. So I think at this time it would be uh, great if anybody wants to nominate yourself for a leadership position or nominate someone else. Um, that would be helpful. As I think we discussed at our last meeting, we don't have strict rules as far as how many people are, you know, we don't have a strict structure as far as having a chair and a vice chair, co-chairs. Um, so the hope would be that today we would hear who is interested in being part of the leadership team and then make a decision on um, how to proceed with a vote depending on interest and nomination. So at this time, um, we'll kind of just do this together here, but if anybody would like to express interest for a leadership role in the committee or nominate someone else, this would be the time. So open floor for nominations. Um, this is Karina. I would like to uh, nominate Joey to stay on, and I would like to uh, nominate Melissa uh, Newman and Chloe Jackson.
Thanks, Karina. I don't know if it makes sense at this time for us to go through folks if if um, people are nominating someone other than themselves, whether they are accepting that nomination at this time or we can just see what other nominations are on the floor. Um, Maybe I could just talk for a couple seconds. Um, this is so Melissa Newman. I appreciate the nomination. Oh. Hello? Sorry, <laughs> it's a lag there. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You can go oh, ahead, no Melissa. Worries. I'm gonna say this is Melissa Newman. I appreciate the nomination, but um, I would have to decline at this time. <laughs> okay. I have a million things going on in the world, but I, I truly appreciate the nomination. Uh, but uh, just being a part of the committee is is awesome all in itself. So I don't necessarily need a leadership role. I'm a leader all in my own zone. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to acknowledge that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is um, Scott. I've been serving as a secretary for the last, um, gosh, has it been two years? Um, and um, yeah, and I've had a great time um, and it's been really rewarding and um, yeah, serving with uh, Joey and Colleen um, and Brenda on the leadership um, team. Uh, but we are expecting uh, another baby in June and um, also so for my own sanity and also for, I think, in the interest of the group to make space for other people to have time on the leadership team, um, I won't be um, accepting nominations or, um, you know, seeking a position on the leadership team again. But I encourage other people to take the opportunity to do so. Um, this is Chloe Jackson. I am also going to have to decline the nomination I do appreciate it but I second for Joey Johnson to stay in the leadership role. Well thanks everyone and thanks Karina for the nomination. Um, at this time I will accept the nomination um, and also just want to express my heartfelt congratulations to Scott for his news. That's extremely exciting <laughs> and it's been so helpful having your role in the leadership team. Um, other nominations for leadership roles or discussion. And maybe just one more reminder that if you're um, a committee member, please put your, your audio on mute. Thanks. Well, this is Jeff. Um, I'd be uh, glad to nominate Colleen to continue if she is interested. I think that the two of you have done a very strong job of uh, leading this uh, group in its in its initial years, and uh, definitely want to acknowledge that. I think it's been a good team. But also understand if uh, somebody wants to take a break. <laughs> but there you go. It took me a minute to get off mute. Um, yeah, I am. I'm certainly happy and willing to continue serving. I'm also happy to open up for more space as well. So I will accept that if that's what people want, and also happy to pass the baton if there's another person willing to step up. This is just a question. I'm wondering if at, um, the way it has been working, as you know, is we've had co-chairs and a secretary role. Since Scott is, um, as he said, not taking on that role moving forward, if we think that has been, you know, that's a role we want, maybe is there anyone who would consider being part of the secretary? And Scott, you can maybe answer any questions about the role, but um, taking notes, being part of planning meetings and setting agendas and things like that has kind of how it's been. Um, generally, again, time commitment wise, we have generally met once, sometimes twice in between our meetings to set the agenda, you know, decide what follow up needs to happen for the committee, that kind of thing. So if there's anyone interested in that role or any other discussion about how we want to, you know, divide roles on leadership. This is Colleen O'Connor Tobrin. I have a question. Is I don't know if 
Brenda's in our meeting today. Um, it's hard for me to tell, but um, I think Brenda's also been a constructive member of the leadership team. And if she's interested, you know, I'd like to leave that space open as well to make sure we don't overlook her if she's gone today. Yeah, thanks for that, Colleen. I had not heard from her today. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as a our bylaws aren't particularly strict about our process for electing, but we knew we needed to on at least an annual basis. So if Brenda is able to join at our next month's meeting, I would propose, you know, one of us could reach out to her in the meantime and potentially at our next month's meeting, you know, move, take a vote on kind of adding her into whatever slate of leadership is elected today. Unless anyone, you know, city staff or otherwise thinks that there would be a problem with that. I don't think that there's anything in our bylaws that would preclude doing something like that. No, I agree. I think it's it'd be fine if we uh, were very, I think it's lovely that it's an informal leadership and that, you know, it allows people who, you know, maybe want to just be a shadow in a leadership role in case they want to step it into the future. So again, I would encourage people, if you're thinking about, I'm not ready to take the reins, but I really got some time and interest in being part of the leadership team, this is a great time to do that as well. Okay, sign me up. Who said that? Was that Queen? It is Queen. Okay. I'm second Queen. Oh, we, okay, hold on. Wait a minute. We gonna first if Brenda, right? Brenda's gonna be and then then Queen. Okay, I mute my mic. Well, we'll reach out to Brenda and see if she's interested and in, available to you know interested and wants to participate in the leadership committee between now and next month's meeting. Um, since she's not here today, but Queen, would you want us to, um, do you want to be considered today to be part of the leadership team? Okay, give me, give me some back. I'm sorry, I'm moving from court to Zoom. So <laughs> give me some, give me a, a little bit of a background on what, which leadership, give me a little bit of uh, contents of what it is. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I think the I'm main the main yeah. thing would be um, participating in meetings with the leadership team and city staff in between our committee meetings once or twice a month um, to plan the agenda, discuss any kind of committee business that needs to happen between meetings. Um, and then as far as what role, I think the it's open whether you what kind of role you would want to play. If you'd want to be a co-chair and help facilitate meetings, if you would want to be a secretary to take notes um, and that kind of thing, or another role of that, you know, it's not really defined. You could name, you could name the role that you would nominate yourself for. And and just to be clear for the secretary role, um, I have not been taking minutes. It's been the city staff taking minutes. Um, and so I, you know, help review them, but you, know, you wouldn't be on the hook for actually taking minutes. Okay, Queen will be the secretary long as she don't have to take notes and uh, I will uh, help y'all out with that, okay? All right, are there any other nominations for leadership positions? or any discussion about leadership formation or roles? I will say as far as um, how chairs have worked, it has been, I think it has worked well to have co-chairs so that I don't know that it really makes sense to have a chair and a vice chair, but if, if folks have differing opinions about that, that's fine. It's been nice, you know, if, if one of us has needed to miss a meeting or something that the other is fully prepped and ready to step in and facilitate, I would maybe put forward that it would um, 
suggest that it remain that way, co-chairs with a secretary. And then Brenda, pending um, her interest, and in, we can consider that at our next month's meeting. This is Jeff, I would agree. I think the system has worked well. Do, um, I know Katie is not on, but do any of the other city staff have any other thoughts or comments before we move forward? No, I think it makes sense. Um, and I would recommend moving a slate too. I mean, I know if that, um, or we could go through one at a time, but I think that the structure as it is has worked well. So that's my city staff opinion. My city staff opinion, this is Lisa Smustad. Uh, the structure has uh, been working very well. Queen agrees, the structure has been working very well. This is Karina, I second that. Are we simply going to take a vote up or down on this uh, nominated slate? Is that the plan? I I think that I would propose. I think that makes sense. I think we're going to just kind of wait and see, you know, where the nominations were. If that was the way to do it, I would, I guess, at this point, think that that would be what would make sense. Do you? Uh, do we need a motion? Would that help? I think that would help. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is Jeff Horwich. Uh, I will move approval of. Uh, uh, Colleen and Joey as uh, co-chairs and Queen as secretary for the uh, coming term of this committee. Can I second that? I second that motion, Melissa Newman. All right, is there any discussion on the motion on the table? Seeing none, I will ask Kelly, could you please take the roll? I will. Um, Corinna Bowler? Aye. Bruce Brenner? Aye. Joey Dabson? Yes. Colleen Ebiger? Aye. Jeff Horowitz? Yes. Chloe Jackson? Yes. Linsky Jacobs? Yes. Queen Kimmins. Queen. Queen. Queen I can come back. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte Kinsley. Yes. Uh, Liliana Latran Garcia. Liliana Latran Garcia. Brenda Marcos, Brenda Marcos, David McGee, David. Yes. Uh, Lisa Mears. Lisa Mears. Melissa Newman. Aye. Colleen O'Connor Toberman. Aye. Maggie Ati? Yes. Scott Schaefer? Yes. Janine Seja? Yes. Russell Smith? Yes. Rose Tang? Yes. Annie Wells? Annie Wells? Annie, are you still on the call? Um, I, I believe the motion still passes, but I think it's 16. I don't know if Annie's still on the call. I'll I'll count. So, but uh, the motion passes. All right. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks everyone. It's always um, you know a little bit awkward. It's a little bit of an awkward position to be facilitating a vote <laughs> for your own continued leadership, but it really has been great working with Colleen and city staff. 
um, and Scott, and it's been great uh, getting a chance to work with you all on all these important policies we're considering. So thanks, and I'm excited for another year. I don't know if Colleen or Queen, you have anything more to add before we move on? I look forward to doing my very best. I think I'm working with an awesome group of people. We care about people. We care about the issue. Thank you for voting. And ditto to all of that. I really enjoyed getting to know this group. And for those who are newer to the, you're new on the on the committee, really looking forward to getting to know you all better. Hopefully, at some point in the next couple of years, we'll be able to do that in person again. Um, but in the meantime, at least I get to see your faces. So thank you. And with that, I think we are turning to Lisa, right? So Lisa, your uh, your uh, good practice on screen sharing, I think, is going to pay off right about now. Do you have it? Yes, yes we can yes, see it. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Smithstead. I'm the manager of the Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes Unit. And today we are here to present to you um, some information about the work we're doing in Minneapolis housing. Uh, the title of our presentation is Home-Based Health Hazards in Minneapolis Housing. And I have with me today Alex Vollmer, uh, who is the supervisor of our unit, and Fardoza Omar, who is, who is our grant, HUD grant manager. So Alex, would you take it away? Sure, thanks Lisa, uh, and thanks to everybody on the committee. Uh, I'm gonna put my camera on. Uh, thanks to everybody on the committee for having us. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to come and uh, speak with you all, um, in addition to just serving this, the, the residents of Minneapolis. Um, so you may have, my name is Alex Vollmer. I'm the supervisor of the Lead and Healthy Homes Unit. Um, you know, our primary function is to investigate cases of lead poisoned children within Minneapolis. Uh, but we are uh, trying to move to a much more holistic approach in uh, addressing a lot of home-based health hazards. Uh, so that's kind of what we wanted to talk with you about today. Um, so just looking through here, uh, you know, Minneapolis has housing stock. Uh, that has potential for a variety of uh, structural and building problems um, that can lead to negative health outcomes. Uh, the Lennon Healthy Homes Unit, like I said, responds to an assortment of building related issues, uh, with the most common being uh, lead based paint. Um, a majority of the lead poisonings that we see are due to deteriorated lead based paint uh, at the child's primary residence. Um, we do have a small number of other sources um, included uh, in, in that investigation, um, such as elevated levels of lead in soil, um, either from paint uh, coming off of a house or historical use of leaded gasoline, uh, as well as consumer products, uh, cookware, um, toys, keys, jewelry, um, all sorts of all sorts of products unfortunately have lead in them um, and kids like to put those things in their mouths. Uh, we have been fortunate. We've done a lot of uh, investigation on uh, on water in Minneapolis and we've done uh, a lot of testing and uh, we have not found uh, elevated levels of lead in water, assuming that the, the uh, system is working normally. Um, so we have not traced any um, elevated levels to the water source in Minneapolis. So that's that's great from our point of view. Um, we also look at um, asthma triggers in houses, uh, which includes mold from water intrusion inside the home, uh, maybe roof leaks or um, holes in the wall, um, or potentially from excessive standing water inside of houses, um, generally from like plumbing leaks um, that are contained inside of um, the walls that are tough to see and, and cause chronic issues. Uh, we also look at pests and pets, um, including uh, cockroach, frass, and dust mites. Um, as well as um, consumer products um, such as aerosol cleaners, air fresheners, uh, or cigarette smoke from um, indoor um, smoking. Uh, we also can respond to um, additional indoor air quality uh, environmental hazards um, such as combustion byproducts from gas fired appliances, water heaters, um, stoves, ovens, things like that, um, as well as we investigate radon gas um, and other off gassing products. Um, inside of the house like carpets, um, paints, and other like types of finishing uh, products. Um, the presence of these hazards conditions can be due to, uh, due to deferred uh, or lack of maintenance um, or behavioral traits. Um, so just kind of like a little overview about how we respond. Um, 
So first, like I said, our, our primary kind of um, duty is to respond to reports of lead poisoning in children ages five and under, um, as well as pregnant women um, uh, that live in Minneapolis. Uh, we receive authorization from the state health department uh, to receive that information uh, and uh, uh, work with clinics uh, to provide that follow-up. Um, we also have um, a complaint-based um, response uh, at rental properties. Uh, or owner occupied houses as well, but we do we do tend to go out into rental properties uh, where people are concerned um, about uh, health hazards or uh, lead based paint and chipping paint inside of their houses. Um, we're fortunate uh, to have resources uh, from Housing and Urban Development, which is a federal agency uh, that stands for HUD on the screen there. Um, we've been very successful in getting these these grant programs over the last 25 years. Um, we just launched a new program in January of 2021, which will last for approximately three and a half years, uh, where we have $5.7 million uh, to reduce lead-based paint hazards. Um, and then, like I said, we're also focusing on um, additional health, um, health and safety hazards inside of the house. And we're starting to build out um, a weatherization uh, program uh, to kind of reduce the total cost burden on living in older houses uh, in Minneapolis. Um, we have a settlement fund from uh, the Northern Metals um, uh, company up in North Minneapolis, uh, which includes $600,000 uh, to do lead testing for children, uh, lead hazard education at, at homes, um, asthma education, and some asthma trigger mitigation. Uh, we do this through face-to-face uh, -face interviews, as well as um, uh, reviewing the house for potential hazards, and we can provide products um, that can reduce the, uh, the hazard risk. Uh, and then also recently, we just got a, a, another environmental justice grant uh, in, from the Environmental Protection Agency, another federal agency, in the amount of $200,000 um, to do lead hazard education, asthma education, and COVID response. So we're uh, piecemealing our, our work together from a, a number of different ways um, and really trying to expand the services that we can provide. Um, so I wanted to show uh, a map of Minneapolis um, and kind of discuss some of the um, socioeconomic items that we run into. Um, there are risk factors associated with both lead exposure um, and asthma triggers. And what we're really trying to show here is just that uh, a lot of those risk factors are concentrated um, in certain areas of the city. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those areas are overlapping with uh, low income and the BIPOC communities. Um, so you can see here um, the or the uh, the yellow um, neighborhoods in Minneapolis are identified as um, higher in asthma risk. Uh, the orange areas are uh, higher with lead poisoning risk, and then um, the red areas have both um, types of risk associated with it. And the the darker black outlines um, are the areas of the city that um, have concentrated amounts and, and elevated amounts of people living under the poverty line, um, as well as where a majority of the residents are um, from the BIPOC community. So next slide, Lisa. Um, so just kind of continuing on, I mean, we know that um, we know that lead poisoning is an environmental justice issue. Um, so just here's a quick history. I know it's uh, hopefully you guys can zoom in a little bit on this. Um, but this is a very detailed map of the 25 years or previous 25 years um, up to 2014 of um, um, lead poisoning cases in Minneapolis. Um, each one of those little squares represents a, a single block uh, in Minneapolis and any square that's colored um, not not white uh, has uh, at least one child um, that had had a uh, diagnosed uh, blood lead level over five micrograms per deciliter, which is the current level that we respond to. Um, the darker the colors get, so the darker reds and oranges um, indicate more children, and the squares that have blue and green um, have the highest number of, of children um, on each of those blocks um, that have uh, been diagnosed with an elevated blood lead level. So you can see. Uh, those darker colored areas definitely are concentrated um, in uh, certain areas of the city. Uh, there's five like kind of primary uh, neighborhoods that we do a lot of work in, um, and those would be uh, both Phillips neighborhoods, Powderhorn, Central, Hawthorne, and Jordan. 
Uh, you can also see from doing um, our questionnaires with our families um, that 87% of the families are reporting uh, as being uh, of a BIPOC community, uh, which does include those who are reporting uh, as white and Hispanic. Um, so a vast majority um, are living our are, are BIPOC community and um, about three quarters of our cases um, are occurring in uh, rental properties. Um, as I stated earlier, deferred or lack of maintenance um, is often the cause for um, lead exposure due to lead paint coming off of those building components that have not received the type of regular upkeep that uh, is required to make, uh, keep them safe and keep them like of sound structure. Um, additionally, um, we have at over 75% are reported uh, as, as being under 50% of area median income. That would be an annual household income. Um, so for a family of four, just to give you an idea of what that is, um, a family of four in 21,000, that level is 51,000. And even still lower is um, over half of our clients are reporting underneath, uh, being underneath 30% of annual median income. Uh, and in 2020, that was um, listed as 31,000 for a family of four. So it's oftentimes people who are um, kind of have their backs against the wall and um, are subjected to a lot of um, um, kind of having to deal with whatever people are throwing at them and they don't have a lot of options and a lot of opportunity unfortunately uh, so next slide lisa um just a couple of quick um uh highlights on kind of what uh lead uh, exposure can do to a child um children who are under the age of six will um if they ingest lead they will absorb into their blood um, roughly 50 to 60 percent of that lead that they ingest uh, it's a really small amount that can affect um, uh, their body. Um, as they're growing, they have a lot of development that's going on, and it primarily affects uh, the nervous system, uh, the brain, the blood, the kidneys, and, and the body. So there's a number of, uh, kind of can go all over the place. Um, it, some of the blood or some of the lead will get uh, expelled, um, but a lot of it, it, it is considered a cumulative toxin. Um, so it, it is inside your blood for a little while, it goes through the body, and it ends up being deposited inside of your uh, bone marrow, uh, which can uh, uh, add to a decrease in uh, bone and muscle growth. Um, so it does live inside of you. Um, it can continue to affect you. Um, and it's important to know this because as an adult, um, you know, under periods of high stress, your body can actually remobilize that lead into your bloodstream and continue to affect all of these different organs. Um, so it really is kind of this like ongoing challenge um, to deal with. Uh, so next slide, Lisa. Um, in addition to um, all of those effects that it has on the individual um, on a much larger uh, population level, uh, we do see that there is a connection between uh, lead exposure and um, what, what I guess kind of what, what the terminology is, is a lot of a lot of poor decision making, um, which includes uh, just a uh, uh, difficulty in managing emotions um, and 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 reacting to situations. Um, so we do have um, a couple of charts here, just showing some uh, research that has been done, um, showing um, uh, overall kind of population uh, crime and pregnancy reports um, that kind of go up and down uh, with the use of lead uh, in gasoline. Um, so until lead was uh, banned in gasoline, um, the average blood lead level across the population was much higher than it is right now. And that's what the blue line, um, or, or it's, 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 it's in connection with that blue line. And as you can see, as these numbers, they just kind of, they ebb and flow um, alongside of each other. You know, so there's, there's the individual um, who's affected by this, but then it can also really spiral onto a, popula a population um, level kind of um, issue. So next slide, Lisa. Uh, the good news is, is that in Minneapolis, uh, we've seen a dramatic and consistent decrease in the total number of children uh, with elevated blood levels, blood lead levels over the 25 years of the program's existence. Um, this is actually looking at, at the level of, of 10 micrograms per deciliter. Like I said, we're actually intervening down to uh, five micrograms. So we're seeing these levels decrease while we're also intervening at a lower level. You know, what we want to see is people ask us a lot of times like, well, we used to have, um, you know, 
the level of concern was 50 micrograms or 40 micrograms, you know, so significantly higher than it is right now. And basically what we're trying to do is that we don't want to see those levels. Like that's the whole idea of our program is that we prevent these kids from from experiencing those types of setbacks and those types of health um, those types of health problems. Like that's that's not something. It's a totally preventable disease, and we don't want to respond after it's been too late. So we want to get to those kids as quickly as possible. And um, we've been fortunate that we've had um, such a dramatic decrease. Um, this this graph only goes up to 2017, um, but in um, just just to kind of give a, a, a perspective. Um, we've had uh, we had less than 70 kids at um, at the five microgram level in 2020. Um, that was significantly lower than what we've seen um, due to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and kids not going to get tested. Um, in 2019, we had 80 kids at that five level. So we're still seeing those decreases, which is really great um, from our point of view. Uh, we want to be working ourselves out of a job, basically. Um, just uh, Quickly wrapping up on some of these visuals, this is just a really quick uh, comparison of 1995 blood levels at 10 micrograms. That's going to be on your left. Um, so each one of these houses represents um, a property that we worked at, um, and you can see the number there is 11, no, just over 1,100 of them, and that's at 10 micrograms. So like I said, at, at five micrograms in 2020, we had uh, 70 cases. In 2019, it was at 80 cases. You can still see that concentration happening in in pockets of the city. Um, but the overall prevalence is significantly less than what we've seen um, in the past. And so that's 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 really good. Um, and then one more, Lisa, just and just our last uh, my my last piece here um, is that I wanted to say that, you know, finding an EDL is really difficult. Um, and these numbers only represent diagnosed patients. Um, typically, kids will go to the doctor. They'll get a, a preliminary capillary draw. If that comes back elevated, the doctor will ask them to come back and get a venous draw. So it requires two visits typically for a child to get to that level. Um, it, while lead is a cumulative toxin, it only stays in your blood for a short period of time. So we also have to catch the kids shortly after their exposure. Most kids are getting tested right around their birthdays um, for their annual checkups. So it's a very narrow window when we can actually um, know that there's a diagnosed blood lead level. So just because you know a test comes back negative doesn't mean that there has been no exposure. Um, so what we really want to be doing is shifting um, our, our focus to more of these prevention strategies as opposed to the reactive strategies um, that we've used in the past. And that you know comes with lowering the, the rate of intervention as well as just reaching out to kids who haven't actually had the, the diagnosis yet. But we want to get into these properties before the children are harmed. Um, as displayed in the maps um, uh, that we had up, there is um, we know where we, we know where these kids are. We know where the highest risk is. We know who in our population and who of our residents and our neighbors are are at the highest risk. And we know what kind of conditions exist that can harm children. So that's that last slide that we wanted to show you is that um, you know when when paint isn't maintained. Um, you know, these are the types of consequences that will happen. And particularly with like windows in old houses is that um, kids are very attracted uh, to the outside. They're curious, they're excited, um, and they want to be uh, experienced in the world. And uh, they get their hands and they get their mouths into a lot of different places. And they also get their toys and their, um, and their food and all sorts of things caught up in these, in these items. Um, so like I said, we do know where these, these hazards are and we want to be able to um, proactively address those um, before kids are getting exposed. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Cardoza and thank you so much for your attention. Cardoza, you may be muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you uh, for having us today and um, allowing us to share uh, with you on the work we are doing in the city. My name is Pardoza Omar. I manage the Lead Hazard Reduction Grant. Uh, Lisa, <laughs> I manage the Lead Hazard Reduction Grant. Um, we got these funds from um, uh, Housing and Urban Development, as Alex has stated. We've got two um, grants currently. Um, one that we got awarded in 2017 and another one that we got awarded in 2020. The one that was awarded in 2017 is 
um, the award amount is $2.7 million. Um, 2.5 million of that went to addressing lead hazards in homes of children that have been lead poisoned. Um, part of it is preventative measures, people that we've meeting in the community and enrolling in our grant program that way. Um, re referrals that we get from housing as well as FIS. Uh, the other uh, $400,000 of the $2.9 million um, is used for, strictly used for other safety and, and health hazards in the home. Um, some of those include uh, radon mitigation, uh, mold and mildew, installing handrails, putting in new vinyl flooring, doing integrated pest management, uh, doing any energy audits and weatherization work replacing furnaces and replacing hot water heaters, especially that last bit with weatherization. It's a program that we've just started building and we're hoping to expand that into our new, in our, in our new grant. In the current grant, we've made 193 properties let safe. Uh, these properties include both um, uh, single family dwellings, um, duplexes and multi units. We've educated over 3000 people by both doing in home education one-on-one uh, -on -one with clients uh, during our inspections or do, during some of our site visits, as well as outreach events. Before COVID, we were having um, about six to seven events per year. Some of these are tabling events. We table at events that are happening in the community. Some of them is because um, we partner with other agencies to do block by block lead testing events. We choose blocks that have higher um, rental properties with possibly more deteriorated lead paint. We block out those um, on our map and then we go out and then make sure we take the uh, the van and test kits on site. Um, uh, also in this uh, current grant, we've um, uh, trained over 200, um, about 200 property owners on how to work uh, less safely. This training comes in two formats, both um, the RRP uh, repair, renovate and painting course, which is an eight hour class, which is targeted towards rental property owners. And then we've got a four hour um, training course uh, that we partner with uh, with sustainable resource on. And that is strictly meant for homeowners. And then in these trainings, they learn how to work with lead safely, how to set up uh, containment in their home while they're doing the lead work, how to uh, do the work properly and how to clean up afterwards so they don't poison themselves and their families or if it's a contractor, so they're not poisoning the people that are, are in the homes that they're working in. Next slide, Lisa. These are some pictures of uh, recent jobs that we've done. Um, generally, when we go into the home uh, um, property that's enrolled in the grant, we do a lead assessment. We test all painted surfaces inside and outside the house. Uh, we go do um, basement, attics, uh, in, uh, exterior of the home. We assess the garage. We compile all of that. We send the reports to the land, uh, the property owner outlining some of the hazards. Most of the sources of exposure for lead are generally in older leaded windows. You know, you've got lead paint on the outside and in inside of the window as well as the back sash. Every time that family opens and closes that window, they're cre creating lead dust. Lead is heavy, so when, when you open the window, air blows in that lead dust is settling right underneath the window. It's on the floor. Kids are crawling on the floor and that's how they're ingesting it and it is getting into their body. Also, window sills are another, um, uh, it's another uh, component that has a, a higher exposure level for kids. Uh, the first picture that you see, it's like a window sill that has the paint tube out. That photo was taken from a home where there was a child with elevated blood lead. You know, window sills are perfect height. Kids are right there holding onto that sill, trying to see what's happening outside. Um, once they, uh, you know, get that lead into their bodies, lead paint is sweet, so they'll go right back to it again. Um, so for um, components like these, like windows, we'll replace them. Window sills, we replace them. We don't even say paint over it. We just replace it completely. Uh, porch floors. The last two photos are pictures of porch floors. You can only imagine in the summer if it's hot, families don't have any air conditioning. The kids are in the uh, porch playing with their toys on the floor and that whole gray uh, paint on that floor is all lead. 
what we usually like to do in uh, when we find components like that is to enclose by putting in new floors in. So that paint is completely not accessible unless the family rips this flooring. <laughs> Uh, in addition to doing um, the lead assessment, our inspectors assess for other hazards in the home. Now, there's 29 hazards we assess for. Lead is included in the 29. Um, some of the other hazards that we assess, assess for is dam and mold, access cold, access heat, missing CO, smoke alarms, assessing for pest, uh, trips and falls. We have limited fund for uh, healthy homes. We, uh, when we go out, we identify the hazards. Most of the homes we go into, we find multiple hazards. These are houses that are uh, built before 1978 with deferred maintenance. Um, uh, so we generally broke down, break down the work that needs to be done with what we can cover with our funds, which are limited. Um, and then um, with, if it's a rental property, we give the landlord a list of other things that are immediate that needs to be taken care of. If it's a homeowner, we usually send them to, we connect them to local resources that could help them address some of those additional hazards that we've identified in the home. Next slide, Lisa. In our current grant, um, everybody in Minneapolis can apply, who meets the requirements can apply uh, for the grant. However, there are two areas that we're, we're mainly focusing on, North and South Minneapolis, that's what you see um, uh, the map on the right hand side. Uh, the current award amount for this grant is $5.7 million. Five million of that is going into addressing lead hazards. Uh, 700,000 is going into healthy homes repairs. We're going to be focusing more on doing weatherization work under this fund. Um, we went from having $400,000 in the grant that's closing now to having $700,000, which is great. Uh, the city is matching that uh, with, um, it's providing $800,000 in match funds um, into this grant. We will be, we're hoping to make uh, 225 homes uh, uh, healthy and safe for families. We're hoping to spend on average about $14,000 per home um, and, and, you know, address any lead hazards that are found in the home in addition to the healthy homes money that's available. Um, also within this grant, we are trying to train contractors. Currently, we've got a limited pool of uh, lead abatement contact contractors, and we've had that for a while in the city. We've got additional funds in this grant, and what we're hoping to do is find people that are interested in taking this training and hopefully becoming lead abatement contractors in, in the city. It's a five-day training. We're willing to um, pay for the training as well as possibly partnering them up with contractors um, that have been in the field for a while for mentorship. We will be training um, also 220 um, individuals, both uh, compromising of landlords, homeowners, uh, and uh, maintenance staff. The reason for training the maintenance staff is more often than not, it's the property managers that are re maintaining the property, retouching up paint, and the, the property owners are nowhere in sight. So our hope is train these people so they know how to work less safely. They're not going into homes. Um, causing death hazards, uh, creating death hazards and a child is lead poison and then we're showing up. So trying to be really preventative in that aspect. In addition to um, everything else, we've got $165,000 um, slotted in this current grant for outreach and education. We're going to continue to obviously table at events, hopefully when we can resume those tasks. Uh, we're also will be um, doing um, blood lead testing in the um, in the neighborhoods, as well as um, uh, developing videos, uh, doing uh, advertising in newspaper ads, um, uh, Facebook posts, uh, bench, uh, bus stop bench, um, uh, putting advertisements there, and um, look, working with um, other nonprofits in both North and South and see if we can do outreach, uh, education outreach through those agencies as well. Next slide, Lisa. Here is the grant flyer. Um, I would be more than happy uh, through Lisa to email you guys um, this flyer. If, if you know anybody that is interested or have other partners um, who could, um, who have people that could 
use these resources, uh, please share it with them. Thank you. So, so we're trying to move our program from just responding to lead poisoning to actually preventing lead poisoning. And to show what this means on a block level, um, on this block there was 20 there were 26 houses a minimum of 18 children were poisoned on this block um, over 20 years and only five of the houses were repaired uh, why only five houses that's because the uh, level that we were responding to was much much higher in the past so um, all these houses are still out there the repairs haven't been made and we want to get back into these houses and make them lead safe so we don't have a, a future child poisoned. Um, our motto is we need to stop using children as lead detectors. The model was set up to respond to children after they were poisoned. We need to get ahead of that. And so to do that over the last two years, we've been training, I think we're up to like six environmental uh, service inspectors now. So when their shop is a little slower in the winter, we can do more inspections in homes to identify hazards. Um, we've been piloting um, integrated inspections with uh, regulatory services, and that's been of great benefit to both programs. The housing inspectors are learning more about lead. We're learning more about housing code so we can provide better services to the residents of the city and we're offering uh, inspections to children below the lead poisoning rate. So again, we get in, we intervene and that child's blood lead level does not continue to rise. And we're targeting these activities into the neighborhoods uh, that have historically had the higher levels of lead poisoning. So this is how we make the change. We know the ages of the housing and we know the neighborhoods we need to get into. We've recently received a city council directive to uh, formulate a lead poisoning prevention plan, uh, which we'll be producing and writing uh, over the next few months. Um, but what role can this committee play? So this committee, uh, we're going to ask you to review and comment on ordinance uh, changes and proposed policy changes that would be included in our poisoning plan. And I'd be happy to listen to any suggestions people have about how they would like to see those things developed. But we will come to you when we do, when we are working on uh, future ordinances and uh, just asking budgetary support for our, our health and housing coordinator position so that we can continue to integrate uh, more our services working with uh, the regulatory services. And that is my presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Lisa. Does anyone have questions for yes, Lisa and her team? Yep, and Lisa, uh, thank you, Lisa, for your presentation and um, the other two people. Um, so this is Karina, and I uh, applaud that. Um, that's I, I I think it's so needed um, for us to have these healthy homes for the housing that you know go year after year being expected, um, and they pass these inspections and families are you know living in slum conditions. So I think it's most needed. Um, and then it also should apply to you know you guys going into these uh, REAC inspections as well um so that homes are continuing to stay healthy um but uh i talked to andrea the other day had a meeting with her and the mayor and i was just talking about my healthy homes project and it's something kind of similar but um it, it, it would even have somebody to go in and do the cleaning for the families so that the most times that they're you know continuing to be reported um the the my organization will go in and help clean up the you know the properties or whatever but I think it's a great idea. I think it's it's, it's been needed, and uh, more people should be aware of it. So uh, I uh, I support it. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Karina. Anyone else? Looks like uh, yeah. Melissa's hand is up. Yeah. First, oh, just real quick. You. I don't think that this presentation was um, linked to the agenda yet. Will it be circulated and shared online? Uh, oh. Yes, our our intention is to uh, have it be with the agenda so people can address the can access the presentation then. Fantastic, thanks. 
So Melissa, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and that was Melissa Newman. Um, just a suggestion, Lisa. I know, you, like you said, you don't want to have to be finding the lead within the children, um, and you already have an idea of the neighborhoods that and houses that have the um, lead issues, and some of them that have been cleaned up, some of them haven't. Have you guys thought of maybe looking on the list um, um, and sending something directly to the landlords? as well as informing them, you know, that it the importance of it and these grants and what's available of the resources and if they happen to have children going that route versus trying to seek out the kids um, um, at the same time. Because you know how, you know, I, to let everybody know, I was on the Northern Meadows Committee um, when it kind of first started and the decree came. But one of the big, big issues and how in reaching out to people was the fear of, renters being retaliated on um, once they've opened this can of worms and the landlords have all these different codes and things that they need to come bring up to speed and uh, to get this get the lead and the mold and everything up out of there but um, have you guys thought of doing it the opposite way and sending something to the landlords to allow you to have access to the house and then at the same time if they have renters um, to test the children accordingly uh, we certainly plan on outreaching aggressively to landlords um, over over the next few years. We've we do mailings. We do we reach out through the rental licensing program uh, to give people information. Um, there are some uh, landlords who have come back to us who have gone through the program and have come back after they purchase new properties and continue to enroll their properties as they acquire them into this program. So I, I like to think uh, that we have. Uh, good relationships with landlords um, in our program. There is a cost sharing element, so, but it's 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 it, the old grant. I don't know how the new math wor works out on it, but it was like for you would get ten thousand dollars of work for a thousand dollars investment in the home. So I, I think we bring the landlords a lot of resources in order to improve these properties. <clears throat> Queen has looks like has a comment. Okay, here I go. <clears throat> All right. So I uh, participated when it was uh, the something uh, stability program. There was a stability program similar to what the city is doing. Found out that we had lead here in our unit and. The cost was $8,000, okay, to do the windows. So my landlord declined because of that, because he would have to charge me $4,000, and then he would pay $4,000. At that time, <clears throat> I, I, I was not able to do that. Um, and I'm wondering if you all have something that is more uh, cost effective for tenants because landlords often do not want to pay to get those windows put in. Number two, on the um, Northern Metals, when I was working with uh, people with Northern Metals, I understood that there was some money available to get kids like dehumidifiers and uh, a couple other different things. I'm wondering, will the city be able to um, pick up that tab and get uh, children um, some dehumidifier or whatever it is? Like that. Thank you. Um, I, I refuse the mic. Yes, um, Queen, the... Over, over the years, over the last 20, 25 years, um, there's been three organizations, a, a minimum of three organizations involved in less lead hazard control funding. And that's been uh, Hennepin County, Sustainable Resource Center, and the Minneapolis Health Department. And over the years, um, the the programs have varied a little as to how, ma how much matching funds need to go into it. So I, I'm sorry that your landlord uh, didn't want to participate and wanted to uh, pass the costs on to you. We don't think that's how it should be if it's a rental property. 
Um, I think the program is very generous with a thousand dollar match to ten thousand dollars worth of uh, work that's being done, and and we're actually have increased the amount of work that can be done in the properties. Uh, now, um, as far as the, so, so I would encourage anybody who is interested in to call us. We're very upfront with all the costs involved and can give costs uh, to people before they sign on the dotted line so that everybody knows uh, what's involved in, uh, in going through one of these pro uh, rehab projects. And for the, the um, Northern Metals funding, yes, that still exists. And in fact, the um, service area has been expanded to all of North Minneapolis and Northeast Minneapolis, and we'll be uh, rolling out some advertising um, on that. So yes, we can provide uh, uh, children with, um, usually it's HEPA air cleaners and allergen bedding covers and um, whatever they need, we will tailor to help uh, reduce the asthma triggers that are in their specific home mm. to coincide with their specific needs. Thank hey, you. Lisa. Oh, my bad. Hey, Lisa, do PHS still, um, does it still exist? I believe that PHS is no longer doing, and that's pediatric home service. I believe they are not doing home <laughs> asthma visits, although if you went through their <laughs> program before, um, some yeah. of those nurses are now working at uh, Children's Hospital, and we do still mm -hmm. uh, stay in touch with mm -hmm. them and accept referrals from them. Okay, yeah, because I still talk to Barb, and you know, okay. All right, yeah, I was curious of that, but yeah, I think it's awesome. And I agree with Queen that, you know, supplying those air purifiers and those materials that can help with that dust and mold and all that stuff that's in these unhealthy homes, I think it matters, so. Yes, and please, and also, please get the word out because we are not getting enough people asking for those resources. Because they probably just don't know that they exist. Um, yes, one thing that's I our big challenge. Too, yeah, they don't know they exist. So one thing I will also say is, um, I know I talk a lot about this to um, Kelly. Maybe you should also make sure you're uh, reacting to the um, three-tier properties. Because if there are three-tier properties and you got you got so many complaints, then that's that'll be where you hit home at, too. Uh, thank you. That that is part of the strategy we've talked about is is targeting those tier three properties for the our, our lead survey inspections, and then of course offering the resources to if we find lead hazards to make those properties safe. Okay, and then it wouldn't help to get on the news and talk about that it's available and it's something that you guys are doing. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hope, hopefully, you will be seeing more of that in the future. Yes. Hello. Joey, I think you had a you have a question or comment. Joey? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Just really briefly a comment and then a, a question, I think maybe for Alex, but um or Lisa. I just want to say how incredible, incredibly helpful it's been to have the health departments work on this for legal aid. We've partnered um and the folks at the health department have, you know, referred cases to legal aid where you know, there might be gaps in the city code of what it, um, what the inspectors can or can't cite for, but then, you know, all of the, you know, legally under state law, landlords need to keep, there are state laws regulating that, you know, landlords need to keep places healthy and safe, regardless of what the city code says, but it's just been so crucial to have um, all of your work on the ground and really focusing on these health hazards. I know lead gets talked about a lot. I think I just want to underscore, um, just how frankly terrifying it is that um, COVID, you know, all the ways that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating, um, you know, these health hazards for people who understandably aren't, you know, are in 2020 for sure. And now into 2021, maybe not going in person to the doctors much, getting labs drawn, you know, maybe, you know, in a place where they're not feeling um, comfortable complaining to the city about an issue in their in their rental property based on rent issues or something else. We know 311 complaints have been significantly down since the pandemic started. So this any sort of affirmative um, um, work that your team is doing, I think, is just so helpful, not only for, you know, enforcing people's rights, you know, and us helping enforce their rights, but to keep them um, healthy and, and frankly alive. So I just want to really underscore the importance of this program from my sp perspective as a legal aid attorney. Um, and then I just wanted to, I know we talk about lead a lot, which is extremely important. I do just want to see if either Alex or Lisa can comment on 
um, or Kelly on sort of the, the current state of city code as it pertains to mold and where you might see opportunities for um, ways that mold and moisture can be better enforced um, in city Kelly. properties. Thanks. Kelly, do you want to take that one? Well, what I can tell you is that we've had many conversations over the years about how to address mold and moisture issues in prop is resident in rental properties. Um, we've made some more progress recently on potential ordinance language that would um, um, that we're with legal aid um, and the health department on possible um, introduction into the ordinance that's very that the specifically says that we can at least address visible mold um, and some other um, obvious moisture issues so we are in the process of doing that or looking at that um, so I guess that's what I could say is that we're uh, working with legal aid and the health department and we're on what what we might do uh, we're looking at modeling some of the language after partners um, in New York and Alex Vollmer did a terrific job of looking at what other cities do and how other cities address it. It's a it's a really difficult. Um, I know it doesn't it doesn't seem that way, but it really is from a regulatory perspective. It's one of the most difficult things for us to regulate simply because um, lots of mold is not visible. Um, sometimes the moisture is hard to detect. It often takes specific equipment to uh, to detect and to monitor. So we're all we're looking at that as well. And and then also from a regulatory perspective, is it best to be regulated by health, by housing, or some combination of our of our two groups? So Joy, did that answer your question? I other than we're we're looking into it and I'm hoping that we'll have some something to show in the next month or two. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Yes, is this a member of the committee? No, I'm not. I am. So a this resident. time. Yeah. yeah, sorry. This conversation right now is um, for the committee members. We had a public comment period at the beginning of the call. And if you would like to comment in the future, you're welcome to during the first 10 minutes of our March meeting. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for understanding. Uh, so we are about at our time for it for this discussion. But was there was, I'll give a chance? Or I don't know, Melissa. I see Melissa had you had your hand up, right? Do you want to yeah. go ahead? And, um, and just real quick, is real Katie quick. on the phone yet? Is Katie joined? Katie Tabinka is is. She... Yep, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> okay. All right. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So sorry, Melissa. Go ahead. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Um, Lisa, were you guys able to, I know you guys had a, an asthma person at one point in time, then they, you know, they long, long, longer work with the city. Were you able to hire someone um, to focus in on asthma and or incorporate COVID uh, as well? And then if you did, um, what, what do you, how are you going to um, hit that, you know, with the ground running and make that a priority? Uh, because asthma, you know, with the Northern Metals has been kind of pushed on the back burner and it's been pushing more and more lead, but asthma's kind of been a forgotten piece of this puzzle. Um, I am very pleased to announce that we did, um, uh, were able to hire somebody and they've been going through our training process. We were fortunate and we were able uh, to acquire uh, Vu Tran, who was who used to work for housing and he is going to be our asthma coordinator. And so um, he's, he's very experienced in things. He is currently this week in lead, in lead training class. And so I expect that you will see him out in the field and he will be um, reinvigorating our Northern Metals outreach as well as running uh, the EPA grant for the, uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more on asthma and lead education and COVID and outreach happening um, coming soon. All right, looks like Bruce has his hand up and then we probably need to move on to Katie for the next piece of our agenda. So go ahead, Bruce. I'm just gonna weigh in as one of the assets that I bring to this committee is 
I'm a general contractor and I'm just, and I'm certified in lead abatement. And just as FYI, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of general contractors in Minneapolis. If you're a general contractor uh, by state law, you have to be lead certified within the first cycle of uh, being a general contractor. So it is a very, very extensive process of uh, going doing lead abatement. And I've done lead abatement numerous times. And, you know, even uh, I, I talk to landlord groups and uh, teach them, because I'm a landlord also, how to do lead abatement encapsulation primarily. Um, so there are other avenues that are kind of being addressed and it's just good for uh, the committee to be aware of some of those things. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa, Alex. Thanks to all of you for um, your presentation and feedback and for answering our questions. And thanks for the, to the committee members for, for And thank you for having us to talk about this. I think I might have frozen. Did I freeze? Katie, I'm going to pass it to Katie. <laughs> sorry. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I missed the first part of the meeting today, but glad to be here for the last uh, item. Um, so I am just going to cover a little bit more, uh, a little bit of information about um, new emergency rental assistance program that is still uh, under development and hoping we can have a little bit of discussion about it as well. So um, I think this came up uh, at our last meeting that um, at the end of the year last year, Congress uh, passed another COVID relief package. Uh, it included $25 billion in emergency rental assistance. Um, that's for the whole country. Um, so of that uh, amount, Minnesota received $375 million. Um, and uh, jurisdictions with populations of more than 200,000 people were eligible to uh, receive a direct allocation of funding. Um, so Minneapolis obviously has more than 200,000 people, and so we were eligible for that. Um, so we did receive a direct allocation of $12.8 million. Um, and so we are currently uh, working with the other jurisdictions that also receive direct allocations of funding, as well as with the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, which will be um, administering the statewide funds, um, uh, working on plans for implementation. Um, the funds, so 90% of the funds uh, must be used to provide financial assistance to renters. Um, that can include back rent, so arrears, um, starting from March 13th, 2020 till present. Um, it can also include up to three months of prospective rent. Um, and um, the eligibility requirements are that it's for households earning 80% uh, of area median income or less. Um, currently in the metro area, 80% of area median income is $80,000 a year. Um, it's, but there's a priority for households earning 50% of area median income or $50,000 a year or less. Um, in addition to those income qualifications, households have to have um, either a, a member of the household who um, has been on unemployment for 90 days, that's the priority. But uh, the other way um, to qualify is that to have a, um, a reduction in household income or in, have incurred significant costs uh, um, or other financial hardship due to COVID-19. Um, and then um, households have to demonstrate a risk of experience of a risk of housing instability. So those are kind of the basic requirements of the program. Um, there, I know there have been a lot of, we've had a lot of discussion in this committee um, about whether people receiving housing choice vouchers or living in public housing are have been, so they have not largely been eligible for past uh, emergency rental assistance programs. Um, I think Jeff put something in the chat before he left um, that uh, 
we have had been having conversations with Minneapolis Public Housing Authority about um, about trying to partner to make sure that we can serve uh, public housing and housing choice voucher holders. However, um, we are still waiting on some guidance from Treasury about the rules around that. So I'll just say that our hope is that we can we can um, serve uh, people living in public housing or who are receiving other forms of rental assistance. Um, the legislation itself says that you cannot duplicate federal benefits. So um, we hope the interpretation will be that means, you know, the city's emergency rental assistance couldn't pay for something that MPHA is also paying for. However, hopefully our rental assistance could pay for the tenant's uh, portion of the rent that the, that the renter is responsible for. So um, we're waiting on some clarity from Treasury about that, um, but that is our hope as, as to what the um, direction is there. Um, Another piece of the program is that uh, landlords can apply directly on behalf of their uh, tenants. Um, they do have to notify their uh, tenants that they would be applying and then they'd have to notify them if they receive assistance on their behalf. Um, or tenants can apply on their own behalf. Um, the payments have to go directly. And this is it's so this can be for rent or utility arrears. So payments have to go directly to landlords or utility companies. However, there is um, a provision in the legislation that if a landlord is uncooperative, then a payment could go directly to a renter. Um, and Treasury has given some guidance on what locals officials are supposed to do or administrators are supposed to do to determine if a landlord is being uncooperative. Um, I think the current guidance says, you know, you have to try calling three times and um, if, if you never get a response, then then you can pay directly to the renter. Um, we are, uh, the city is working on um, just figuring out all of the pieces of how to implement this. One thing we heard, have heard quite a bit and is that it was really confusing last year when there were like four or five different emergency rental assistance programs available at the same time that all had kind you know slightly different rules, and so um, we are. That's why we're talking so frequently with the other jurisdictions and the state. Um, we're trying to align as much as we can in terms of how the application process works and the the guidelines for the programs. Um, I think we really want to make sure that that the requirements are kind of as broad as possible to the extent that we can. For example, um, I mentioned that um, one of the pieces is that a household must be experiencing financial instability due to COVID. Um, we're hoping that the guidance we receive from Treasury is that that can be pretty open ended, like people should be able to sort of attest in writing that they're experiencing financial instability due to COVID and that should be hopefully sufficient. So the initial guide, so Treasury issued some initial guidance um, right before the shift in administrations uh, at the federal level. Um, it, that, that guidance um, did indicate they'd want more documentation than kind of what we were <laughs> hoping it would say. Um, however, they have now said they're Issue, they're going to be issuing revised guidance. Um, they've their website for about a week and a half has said coming soon. <laughs> um, so I don't know what soon means, but I <laughs> we had kind of thought we'd have it last week. We still don't have it. Um, so we're waiting on that a little bit. In the meantime, um, the city is um, is uh, reaching out. We're trying to. Um, uh, uh, we've issued some solicitations to find ad administrators for programs. One is in partnership with um, other metro jurisdictions looking for an administrator that would be more focused on help, uh, um, getting landlord, helping landlords through the application process. And then we're also doing the same thing on the tenant side. So um, it's really the same program. It's just like both both tenants or landlords can apply and we anticipate we'll have different administrators who will be focused on tenants versus uh, landlords. Um, and uh, again, the other piece is we're hoping there will be sort of centralized intake and application systems among all the um, jurisdictions that have received um, allocations of funding. 
So that's kind of where we are. We're expecting to bring some um, requests uh, to council later this month um, for being able to kind of start to put pieces of the program in place. And we hope to launch in March, um, but there are still some you know, pieces we need to just work out among all the different partners. Um, but uh, I'd like to hopefully, um, happy to answer any questions, but then would love to hear from the committee. Um, you know, I know many of you have worked with people um, or maybe even, you know, applied yourself to some of these programs that were open last year um, and would love to hear um, from you what you think some of the biggest barriers were that we could try to like overcome or not have be barriers this time around as we have this new money. Um, and just as an FYI, the uh, the there is another COVID relief package that Congress is considering right now. Um, and the current proposal is that there would be another $19 billion in emergency rental assistance in addition to this $25 billion that they passed at the end of the year last year. So again, that's still being debated, but it, it is possible we're going to have even more money than what we have right now, which is a great thing. And so we want to get the program set up in a way that they're serving people well and that the process is smooth um, so that we can help as many people as possible. So um, so again, I'd love to just kind of, well, first answer any questions and then hear from all of you on what you think we should be mindful of as, as we're designing this program along with these um, other jurisdictional partners. Hey, Katie, this is uh, Karina. Hi, Karina, how are you? I'm good, thanks for asking. I know we have Amina on. I heard her kind of come in, but I don't know if she's able to talk. Um, I know I recently spoke with her and she applied for three other programs or two other programs and the same thing happened where she got denied. And um, I was on my school PTA meeting uh, day before yesterday and there was a couple of parents on there as well that reached out to some different organizations that popped up that's doing something similar to the rental assistance and um, they were denied as well. Um, they didn't live in public housing, um, but somehow whatever it was that they had, they got denied on both, both two different programs. So I don't know the other ones that's out there, but it sounds like it's more popping up, but they still kind of have that same cap where um, they're denying renters. So I think with those programs and the legislation or whoever is all compiling this language or these applications, they need to talk to the renters at this point because they need to look at the renter circumstances and figure out what's really happening. And if people are being denied now who don't even live in public housing or any sort of HUD, federal housing or anything like that. So we need to probably start talking to the renters. I'm I, I'm seeing a lot of hands coming up. So in addition, we've got so I'm going to go in order to Char Charlotte, Queen, Cecil, and Chloe. In terms of comments, so Charlotte, you want to go? Hi, Katie. It's Charlotte. Um, first of all, thank you for all your work on this. Um, one of the things that that we found was if there was any sort of leg, like it was really hard to track what was happening. So um, we found a number of people who like. A, a, a good amount of time had passed since they had applied and it was really hard to figure out who to contact and who to call. And so I've, I've heard that there's potentially going to be some kind of dashboard to track status. And I just think for uh, both renters to do themselves and then also for advocates to help guide renters if there's any accessibility issues, having a place, one place where, where people could go just to see if, is this a normal waiting period or has there been a problem um, would be really yeah. useful this next time around. <clears throat> Thanks, Charlotte. That's really helpful, um, and and that's definitely feedback we've heard quite a bit from um, the programs last year. And so one of the goals is to have a centralized application tool that ideally um, both applicants or people working on their behalf could go in and see the status, and that there'd be more ongoing communication about like if a document's needed or something like that. So um, so that's really helpful and that is a goal um, here. Um, so we're hopefully we'll get to that <laughs> that 
point. Thanks. Queen, are you able to, are you uh, on now? Queen, go yes, ahead I next. I am, I am. Okay, so uh, I was one of the people that had an issue with figuring out how does this thing really work? After I applied, then I found out that the county had, I guess, assigned Catholic charities to actually do the questioning. I didn't answer a question right, and automatically I was just hung up on it out of the queue, and I couldn't take advantage of any of that. So I, I wasn't behind in my rent at the time, um, and so I, I just didn't qualify. What I would like is to have more uh, information given out to residents about this, because I think that when people aren't engaged, they don't understand what's going on. They just are told, hey, there these things are happening. There's something that's available, but uh, things get to moving rather quickly when money is involved and automatically it gets allocated somewhere else and the real people that need the help don't always receive the benefits or, or the, the impact is not made with those individuals. So I would like to see if we could do an engagement with more uh, residents. And if that is possible, then um, be able to uh, have those you know, give out this information again, because I think that's, again, that's going to be way more helpful than just someone within us who are engaged all the time. Um, yeah, I just like to see that happen. And hopefully we have some type of tracking uh, that will allow us to, um, to stay on top of who really gets the help and who does it really impact at the end of the day. I'm gonna I'm recuse myself from that, okay? Thank you. Yield the mic. Thanks, Queen. Um, and briefly, I'll just say that I, I really appreciate that comment. I think one of the things that, um, that happened last year, you know, the state had that $100 million available um, for emergency housing assistance they at the toward the end of when the money was going to be available they got nervous that there was still quite a bit left and did a big media push with the governor and others and then it was like overwhelming in terms of you know there were these nonprofit administrators trying to process things and they got kind of flooded and so i think um i think one of the lessons from that is that there needs to be like a real uh coordinated uh media and outreach kind of strategy um, and so I know that's one thing that the state has been talking about. Another thing that we are talking about um, for Minneapolis and Hennepin County um, is is getting some funding to community organize community based organizations who can do concerted outreach to the communities that they work with to make sure they know this is available and help them through the application process. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned that 90% of the money has to be used for direct assistance. 10% can be used for administrative costs. Um, we are going to have to use some of that to pay administrators and um, for the technology and other pieces of this. But we are planning to um, either use some of those administrative costs here or, or use some other funding through the Community Development Block Grant program to pay community organizations as well um, to do outreach and, um, and, and hopefully also address the issue of like, somebody may be just misanswering a question and getting kicked out of the process. Like that's another thing we're trying to address. So thank you, Queen, for raising all of those points. And one more thing, I would like to take part in any engagement efforts to outreach in any communities that you need me. I got a lot of plugs in different communities. I'd like to utilize that. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Queen. Bethel was next, and then Chloe. Thank you. Um, Katie, as you know, our industry had a lot of experience with a lot of different programs. Uh, by far and away, um, 
the program that that earned the highest marks mm -hmm. was what happened with Hennepin County, Scott, Dakota County, um, the partnership with Family Housing Fund and Housing Link. It was very streamlined. The checks arrived uh, <clears throat> in about a month, um, whereas we're still waiting. Uh, we've got owners with dozens and dozens and dozens of residents and and uh, I heard of one case today they're still waiting for a $75,000 check uh, for a portfolio from the state on the chat money which was November and December rent um, whereas Hennepin County got their money out in very short order it was very efficient um, there was some missteps at the beginning but even <coughs> having to go through the reapplication process uh, was, was very streamlined um, for um, direct landlord assistance. The the other aspect that was um, challenging and in our office here, we even had some direct experience with this was um, English as second language speakers. Uh, it was uh, very demoralizing. Um, they tried and tried. The interpretation services weren't available. They were directed to the internet. They don't have uh, that they tried to do stuff on their phone it didn't work they didn't have internet access the libraries here and uh phillips were very hard to access um so there were there were real real inequities um for especially some of our immigrant communities um and they were very frustrated because they were told there is this money they were experiencing real hardship as um, service workers, which we know have been one of the highest impact groups, and they just kept, kept feeling um, like they were trying to do the right thing and they re just met roadblocks. And that was particularly um, going through 211 and into the chat pro program. So uh, that's a summary of, you know, the broad experience. And, you know, certainly we've spoken to MHFA at, at length to say, look at the model that Hennepin, Dakota, and, and Scott County used. It was very efficient. Thanks, Cecil. That's all very helpful input. And I think part of um, what I mentioned, my, you know, what I mentioned in response to Queen's comment too. I think our intention would be to partner with community-based organizations that can work. Not. That's not the only way to to um, assist those who maybe not be native English speakers, but that will be one way. We're intending to have applications available in, in multiple languages and hopefully administrators that have um, ability to serve people in multiple languages. But I think that's a really important point and one that's always um, challenging and something we need to be really mindful of. So thank yeah, you. And, and, and just from my perspective as a manager, please don't assume literacy. I, I just get very frustrated by that. I have to, I help a lot of residents with filling out forms and paperwork because that that's just not a skill that they have. Um, and we've got to remove those barriers. Okay. All right, so next we have Chloe and then Bruce and then Melissa. Um. So I just have a few things to say on this. It seems like there's going to be more barriers, if anything, for renters to get access to this funding because of the fact that they need to have a family member on unemployment as a priority. And then if that's not the case, then they need to reduce income or incur costs or they need to demonstrate risk of housing instability. If someone can provide proof that they're behind on their rent, should, that to me should feel sufficient enough that these people need help. And then if people are denied, there needs to be some type of appeal process. That way, if there was an error in the application process or something like that, those things can be fixed and they, should, they shouldn't be denied the second time around. Thanks, Chloe. That's a really important point. Um, so thank you. And I... Um, I don't know if, uh, I know we had an appeal process like for the gap funds for housing program with the city, but, um, 
but that isn't something we've talked a lot about yet and not to that's not an indication that there won't be one it's just um, I appreciate you raising that because it's a really important process we need to talk through. Um, and then I'll just say on the qualifications, um, you know, I think the balance we're trying, well, we, there are certain things we're going to have to do because the federal legislation says that's what we have to do. Um, but beyond that, we are really trying to be as, um, have as few requirements as possible. So I really appreciate you raising that point because I think it's it's really important. Thank you. All right, Bruce. I just want to give a real life example. Uh, I, I had a tenant that missed her September rent. She, you know, I, I, with all my tenants, I share all the resources. So she said, okay, I'm going to apply. So there's two separate issues here. So we, we, we got the application in for the COVID relief. It took 60 days to even get her case reviewed. And then uh, she gets interviewed. She got denied because, and I want this is kind of for Minneapolis. She ended up getting denied because she had lost hours and things. But they they said her lost hours were because of the riots, not because of COVID. So I'm hearing from other people that that was an excuse of what was being used. So we didn't end up finding out this until December. By that, and they said, oh well, just you know you just to uh, apply for the emergency aid you can you'll get that right away well if we would have known we didn't have to wait 60 to 90 days i mean it's just there's that juggling right so you know i just got her september check last week so the, the second piece is i ended up doing and and my county commissioner said bruce you have to realize that a lot of people who are struggling are just barely able to keep their head above water so returning phone calls, filling out paperwork, these kind of things don't always happen. So I'm just going to encourage you. I mean, I ended up pushing this through the process probably 80%, right? Even when she got the, the new application, I, I, I stopped back over and said, where are we? She goes, oh, I have this form right. She didn't even bother to fill the forms back out, right? So and, and everyone's different. I'm just, I, I acknowledge that, right? But if you, if, if you tell a landlord they can get their money I'm going to tell you they're going to push this through, right? So if you make that an avenue, you know, I'm going to help my tenants clear their debt. Like any landlord I know, and I know hundreds, right? It's That's what's going to happen. So I just want to share those two pieces that there's two things going on. Thank you. But watch out for the, it's not COVID, it was riots that caused your loss. So thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. All right, uh, Chloe, and then Joey has a comment, and then um, we've, we've got a couple in the chat that either you, people can read, but I can also read them, make sure everyone sees that. Um, so, Chloe. I think Chloe, did Chloe have another comment? She just talked. And I think Chloe. Melissa has her hand up before me. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm mixing it. I'm looking at, yeah, Chloe, uh, Melissa is who I meant to say. Sorry, Chloe already spoke. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> Hello. Just kind of wanted to mirror a little bit what Bruce was saying. Um, that there should be some sort of an avenue where to assist their tenants as they receiving tax breaks for allowing lower income housing on their properties um, and keeping housing and rent affordable. So it hand in hand with the tenants and you know there's some sort of way or if a letter can be written you know to assist with the process so it's so that's not so much heavy restrictions but that everybody is able to but that the landlord let be a responsibility on both halves the landlords and the tenants get the service that that would be definitely um definitely helpful and and if, it, if the landlords are able to assist and even you know let's re reducing the restrictions not just let it be so difficult and they can prove that this is truly a hardship for um and then i don't know is my internet going can you guys hear me spotty you're, you're breaking like, up a little bit everything's we can freezing now yeah <laughs> okay i try to switch the wi-fi back and forth but it's like freezing up and it looks like it but but yeah no if it if it, it can be um on both ends 
uh, the landlord and the tenants to be able to help each other and, um, you know, minimize them. Probably we look at the restrictions and see what it is and why people are getting denied. And what are you asking? Are you just asking for uh, proof that they're on unemployment? Or are you asking that their checking account is negative and they haven't paid their landlord rent? Or, you know, what is it? But, um, yeah, the landlords should be help helpful. There should be a process for landlords to apply for their tenants as well. So somebody might get approved. Maybe the landlord gets approved, but they get denied on their own. Um, but they can get it taken care of and so nobody's homeless. Thank you, Melissa. And that is our intention is, is or that's what we'll be bringing forward to the council is to have both of, and, and that is allowed by the legislation itself to have both a process for landlords to apply and tenants to apply. So um, th thank you. So I'm just going to read these two comments um, so make sure everyone can hear them and then I'll pass to Joey for Joey, your comment and then maybe you can close us out as I know we're almost at time here and there's lots of discussion. Um, so David McGee said last round provided Minnesota Home Ownership Center and Habitat a huge amount of the resources, $10 million. Build Wealth Minnesota, which is David's organization, applied for $700,000 and was denied. We work with literally hundreds of families each year. Can we consider having grassroots and boots on the ground community-based organizations be administrators and official conduits to get the funding in the hands of those that are most needy? Also, renter education should be additional consideration in conjunction with landlord education. And then Janine said, I presume that a major barrier for many renters was, will be, the process itself, even with a dashboard, which sounds like a great improvement, and even when landlords can apply on tenants' behalf, which also sounds great, due to literacy, technology hurdles, et cetera. It might help to include the grassroots advocacy groups in the end-to-end -end marketing message messaging. For example, funds are available, and here's who can help you apply for them if you get stuck. Great suggestion. Also, volunteers who understand the system could partner with tenants for the application process. Um, so those are a couple additional comments from our colleagues on the committee. Um, Joey, I'll pass it to you and then like for your comment. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, thank you to Katie for taking the time to get this kind of feedback on previous programs and as we're thinking about future programs. Um, and I think that it was the will of this committee became clear last month that people were really interested in sharing this. And then we, I'm really glad that um, you were here to make time for this today. I think this is a good example of all the different perspectives that our committee brings to these issues. And I just then want to say um, to transition, I know we only have six minutes left, but we did uh, vote to have a, sh a brief discussion about the rent stabilization um, public hearing that is later this month. So Robin, if you're still on the line, could you, I know, again, we only have a few minutes, but if you could give a brief um, overview of sort of the state of where things are at and what is and isn't being voted on, and um, then the committee can maybe discuss just for a couple minutes if there's anything we want to say or do. Otherwise, it will be information, I think, helpful for people to know. Um, so thanks, Robin. Sure. Very briefly, um, the council has uh, set a public hearing for the 24th starting at 1.30 or, or the meeting that starts at 1.30 uh, at the Policy and uh, Government Oversight or POGO Committee on two proposed charter amendments that would enable the city to consider having a rent control or rent stabilization uh, policy. Um, the, the two charter amendments would, um, the, the, the first one would give the council the authority to either adopt a rent stabilization ordinance or put a rent stabilization policy on a future ballot. And the second one would allow the people of Minneapolis by petition to put a rent stabilization policy before people, voters on a future ballot. Um, the idea is to um, finish the work on this uh, at the full council meeting on the 26th of February and hand it to the Charter Commission. They, by state law, have 150 days to review proposed charter amendments. Um, that would give them the time that they need to, to look at that uh, and get something back to the council by August uh, so that the council can then decide in a final way whether to put something forward uh, to put on the ballot this November. Um, and then those questions, if they do get onto the ballot in November, would have, uh, you know, we would have a robust campaign. I would expect folks, both for and against would be doing a lot of direct contact with folks 
has to get 51% of the vote to uh, be adopted. Uh, and then after that, we could have a conversation based on what the result is about whether or not to have a policy. Very quickly, the um, the one other piece that folks should know is that we have contracted with Cura, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Um, they're doing some some studying on rent stabilization policies with uh, an eye to the local economy here, and they will be giving a presentation at a um, council study session on the 23rd, so the day before the public hearing. Great, and so the so the study session will be um, as you just described, and then the public hearing will be about whether or not it's like there's kind of a few steps toward there's not a rent control or rent stabilization policy formed yet that um, there are steps before that um, period would happen. But we just wanted to make sure folks knew about the public hearing opportunity on the 24th, as well as the study session on the 23rd. Um, and we're almost at time, but you know maybe at our next meeting we can talk about how. This committee wants to engage with um, some of these other ordinances that'll be coming down the spring, whether we want to have a smaller work group or not. But we'll save that. Um, and so this committee will have an opportunity um, to review any policies, substantive policies, as they get developed. And it looks like Rose, do you have your hand up? Hi. Yeah, I did. And I, I think mostly just a question for Robin because obviously we won't be able to, um, you know, have a full discussion and. Um, weigh in on the 20 by the 24th as a committee. Is there another opportunity for us to weigh in as a committee? Um, and when would that be? Uh, yes, so it, like I tried to say the. Um, the council vote on the 26th of this month will be to refer this issue to the Charter Commission and then they send it back to the to the council after their 150 days. So the council's final decision on this is not made in February, it's made in August. So so even on the question, should we put these charter amendments on the ballot? And even maybe like, are these phrased the right way or should, we, should they be phrased differently? There will be some opportunities to engage both with the charter commission in that, in their process, and then between now and, and August with the, with the council, um, and and to give the council a final um, yes, you should put this on the ballot or no, you shouldn't put this on the ballot um, this year. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh no. no uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, and I guess I have another like technical question about this committee and what we're able to to do. Like what's within our um, I don't know. Uh, like our if what is our ability to like make a public statement or um, you know uh, like actively encourage something to be passed <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, so I would just say um, if if the committee votes on having a public. Uh, no position on something like that. Uh, that's definitely something that I would consider appropriate and within your authority to do uh, to recommend. Yes, you should put this on the ballot or no, we don't think that's a good idea. Don't put that on the ballot. Um, I don't know if you were asking this, but I'll just say uh, if individuals who are on this committee want to speak at the public hearing, um, you could definitely refer to yourselves as a member of this committee, I would just shy away from saying, and this is the the um, opinion of the committee if the committee hasn't taken a full vote on it yet. Great, so the leadership committee will meet after this meeting um, and we'll kind of get everything that we promised to circulate to people out, the, the PowerPoint from health um, and information about these hearings. So we'll send um, a substantive, you know, kind of a, a thorough follow-up uh, email to members for some more links to information about all the things we talked about today. So it's 501. We had a jam packed, but lots of really good discussions. Thank you everybody for your time. And I hope you have a really nice evening. Stay warm and safe this month. We'll see you in March. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you.